Welcome, everyone. This is Debbie Mayberry with National Kitchen and Bath Association. You are here for our third webinar of the month on color and uh, style trends. Today's session is called Fractalize Your Designs, How Nature Reveals What Feels Right, Part 2, with Richard Landon, who's a certified master kitchen and bath designer, and he's the owner of Richard Landon Design based in Seattle. But before we get started, we also want to thank uh, Amarok for their generous sponsorship. And I have Peter Wells here with us. He's the a senior principal designer at Amarok, uh, and he's going to say a few words before we get started. So, Peter, we're if you're there, we're ready to go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie and Richard. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining NKBA's webinar series in today's session. I'm very happy to be here today on behalf of Amarok to thank you for participating. Uh, if you haven't uh, heard anything about Amrock or don't know a little bit about Amrock. Um, for over 90 years, Amrock has been dedicated to bringing you the latest in kitchen and bath decorative hardware that is very trendy, stylish, and unique, offering the latest finishes and merchandising tools to support your design selection needs. And we are very much involved in the kitchen and bath industry through NKBA Association and others. And we are very happy uh, to sponsor this month's webinar series. Uh, we believe continuing education is an important part uh, for all of us to not only get educated, but to get energized to do what we all love to do every day. So after this CEU webinar, take the time to get to know us. Uh, we're located at mrock.com, and I'm on most social networking outlets like Pinterest, House, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, and we're also included in interior design software like 2020 and Envision for designers and builders. Or you could just simply reach out to our customer care team, uh, which Debbie uh, will provide an email for after this webinar. So thank you and hope you enjoy. Well, thank you, Peter. And Richard, if you're available, we're ready to I'm here. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. <clears throat> Let's just start right with the kind of things that make my mom happy, you know, seeing all the things that I've done. And she finally forgave me for not uh, going to med school. Off to the right here is a picture of the kitchen that won Best Overall Kitchen winner uh, back actually now almost 13 years ago. And I mentioned that with some pride because when you fractalize your designs, you will find that they have very, very, very long legs in terms of um, still looking good. This kitchen has hand cast glass counters over flamed copper with concrete counters in the, sandwiched in between the two ends with mother of pearl uh, dropped into the concrete. So, and if you notice carefully, the end of the kitchen is actually floating on a steel I-beam structure eight inches off the floor. That reflects the overall architecture of the house, which was an I-beam uh, house uh, floating over the valleys on either side. But mainly the thing I want you to understand, please, is that I've been fascinated for a long time by how nature reveals what feels right to us. So. For those of you who t were in my first seminar on this topic, this will be a review for some of you who are new to this. I'm going to review and contrast the static geometry of man with the dynamic geometry of nature. I'm going to review the principles that I, have, I have distilled this down to, the four fractal principles uh, for feels right design. And I want to sh demonstrate and show how this thinking can be applied to your kitchen designs and to what we all realize is a huge shift away from the single purpose room that the kitchen was back in the 1950s and for many, many decades before and after. And what I also though want to share some strategies that will help you uh, work with your clients in ways that will enable them to more um, embrace this change and embrace change in how kitchens look, feel, work, and how they uh, fit into our lives. It's a very different world now with the kitchen as the living room. So classic geometry creates rooms that are logical and incremental, predictable, closed, uh, suited to a single purpose, and that was the kitchen until the 1970s. Now, I don't know, I'm going to say for a second here, I made most of these slides really big print because I don't know, some people are maybe just looking at this on an iPad or, or some other smaller device. <clears throat> and so I've gone out of my way in this seminar to try to make the print really large and, and, and legible for you. Nature doesn't like uniformity at all. And 
So we have to ask, why is it we keep using high school geometry for kitchen and bath design? Well, it's, the answer is it simplifies complexity. Shapes are easy to count. Shapes are easy to define and measure, and symmetry is readily communicable to people. You also have to look back and realizing that key to winning World War II was mass manufacturing of standardized components. And so coming out of World War II, standardization became the best way to build housing in kitchens quickly. And so this quickly altered what felt right to us. And we have now normalized what isn't natural. Just want to emphasize that. We have normalized what is not natural. For decades, I have felt this way. I, I uh, got into this career as a kitchen designer, an accidental career, an act of compassion for a young widow. And out of that act of compassion of replacing her kitchen cabinets, which were falling apart, it launched me into a whole new, another career out of the teaching profession. And from the very beginning, I've been very focused on what is it that feels right to you? And what is it that works better than what you've been used to? So I've been fortunate to be able to develop things over my career, develop ways of approaching design that aren't based upon standardized components, fitting them into a space. And this is now very current, and this is what I want to share with you today. I was very, um, here's the problem. The familiar and conventional has actually become good. And I was thrilled to discover this book. I highly commend it to you. There, are, It covers a lot of territory. You're not going to need to read the sections on schools and commercial institutions and libraries, et cetera. Yet there's a tremendous amount in this book about the residential sector. And Sarah Williams Coldhagen is an architectural critic. She was an associate professor in the School of Architecture at Harvard, so she's got some street cred, as they say. And she documents, using the latest in cognitive psychology and other realms, that consumers, like many of us, they get to a point where we, they can prefer conventional design, even if the design serves them very poorly. And that over time, we get so used to this, we begin to prefer it even. And then she makes this stunning statement. In this way, people can and do come to judge inferior places that serve them poorly or even harm them in covert ways as indisputably, objectively good. Just think about that for a second and ask, have I gotten so used to designing and so used to living in homes that are harming me in covert ways, serving me poorly, that I actually think it's good? That's a pretty stunning statement. Uh, and I, I do hope that in, as we go through this, you're going to begin to understand, it's actually one of the principles I'll cover in a little bit, that your reaction to that comment and the way you feel about that comment and that perspective is information for you about something that actually matters. So nature embraces dynamical systems. It's not static. It's not linear. The systems are open and they're prone to random events. So nature's designs that we love to be out in, and especially in this new COVID crisis that we've been in, I see people walking and, and being about in my neighborhood that I've never seen before. So people want to get out. They want to be out in the open. They want to be out in nature. We're fortunate to live on a green belt, and I see people all the time that I've never seen before. Because nature's designs are multifaceted. They're complex. They're interdependent. They're temporally attuned, in other words, affected by the passing of time. So nature loves ordered imperfection. And there was no real math to describe these shapes and systems until this fellow, uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, uh, wrote this book, very technical, don't bother trying to read it, but he coined the term fractal to suggest fractured and fractional and, he described, and then this was made more accessible, and I do recommend this book, The Patterns of Chaos by John Briggs. It came out in 1992, so it's been around for a while, this way of thinking. And he points out that fractals are these unique patterns left behind by a world at work 
You see them every day. You don't even realize you're seeing them as you watch the water twisting out of the tap. Or, and you, if you learn to recognize them, you'll never see things the same way in your world again. And you'll never design kitchens in quite the same way again. And you'll be better prepared to explain to your clients what about moving this direction is going to actually fit you better than what you've been accustomed to. So nature's fractal characteristics, John Briggs in his book distills down to it, it is scaling, self-similarity, what I call resemblances, transitions where materials meet, and randomness. Those are four things that we find true of what's out there in nature. So I use what I call the Goldilocks principle when I'm working with my clients. I talk about Papa Bear, Mama Bear, Baby Bear. And I'm going to be showing you examples of that. And then self-similarity is a little more complex because nature's uh, in nature shapes at one scale in different type are seen as connected because they're similar in shape. So we start with the concept of scaling, that we're used to things scaling, papa bear, mama bear, baby bear, yet we have a unique ability as humans to make connections between, between things that are completely different in type and completely different in scale. And good design makes use of this resemblance, connection. Scaling and self-similarity often pair up. Like you see in this photo, we can see a connection between that upstretched arm, the 15-foot tall fin of a whale, and then the stop action of the hummingbird. Radically different in scale, yet I can make a connection between them. Nature also produces elements that push and pull at each other. There's textural changes occurring at edges and boundaries. And there's energy at the points of transitions. It's one reason why we like to see crown around the top of a room. We like seeing things that define and make the transition special in some way. Nature also does things that, well, a lawn full of daisy is just irritating, but a lawn with a single daisy will get your attention. And oftentimes, if you're walking with a, a child, they'll run over to pick it. Because in nature, unexpected things happen. Irregularities abound. And I call this the UFO principle. It's an unexpected, fun occurrence. And I firmly believe every kitchen, every bath, every room we work in needs something unexpected to happen in order for it to feel right to those who are in that space. It could be as simple as some, a decorative element that you didn't expect. It can be any number of different things, yet really actively consider what in this. Years ago, when Fu Tung Cheng introduced concrete counters to the media and took over the world in that realm, one of the pictures they would show was a concrete counter in which he'd put this little glass receptacle for a flower right at the corner where you could tuck in a flower. It captured people's attention because it was an unexpected fun occurrence. So here is the way nature fractalizes our world. Scaling, the Goldilocks principle, self-similarity, the resemblance connection. We see energy at the points of transition and we have this randomness happening about us, what I call the UFO principle. So I'm going to pause to see if you've put up any questions in this first little thing in the chat, chat box. Debbie, how are we doing? I, hi, Richard. Uh, so I see nothing just yet. Everyone's just intently listening. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So <laughs> kitchens then became standardized landscapes. Remember back to what I said at the beginning, standardization, mass manufacturing, coming out of World War II, housing GIs, cabinets became... Uh, it's very static. One style, one color, centered element, sink, centered in front of windows, linear, uniform shapes, 24 deep, 12 inches on the top, 36 inch high counters, 30 inch high uppers, standardization ruled. And the room became a kitchen became a room just for meal prep. 
And now kitchens are multifaceted, mixed styles, complex, functionally positioned elements are beginning to show up much more commonly where the sink is where it's needed, not necessarily centered on a window. We're gonna to get to that at the very end of this presentation. Open, there's, it's a room for socializing and living. And surfaces now, I remember when you could basically just buy granite polished and that was it. And now you have mat and you have home, you have hammered, you have all these other surfaces, these textures that are available to us, it's wonderful. Some paint manufacturers have seven, eight sheens. One in particular, the one that most residential designers uh, use. But I'm not allowed to say that. So computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing, CAD CAM is moving us to a new normal, okay? In this kitchen, there's scaling of materials. There's bookmatched walnut. There's a red oak floor. We have high gloss laminate. We have thermally structured laminate. There's scaling of textures. The walnut is matte. There's orbital finish on the stainless steel counter, which is very swirly. The quartz and the tile and the laminate are glossy. The thermally structured laminate has a sort of a ripple fit. There's a physical texture that you can actually feel as you run your hands over it. I want to point out that I typically like to see wood where people are sitting because warm wood is warm to the touch. It doesn't make noise when things fall over on it and break dishes. So to any design, we typically start with shape, but to any shape, we can add and scale patterns, textures, and colors. When I'm working with clients on choosing the materials and the finishes and the, all these different things, I, I make an effort to keep it that simple because it's so overwhelming. The number of possibilities that exist now in tile and in other materials, plain flat can overwhelm our clients. So I am constantly reminding them, you know, it's just first let's make sure we have the room shaped in a way you like, with the way the shapes appear as you feel feel walking around them, imagine what that's like. That's where 3D imagery can really help now. And then let's focus on, as we look through materials, what is it that most appeals to you? Is it the pattern? Is it the texture? Is it the color? And one of the things that I, I do with this is I, uh, many of the clients now will have Pinterest books or house books or things like that. I have them send me their, their photos that they've snipped, yet I also ask them to put on those photos or label the photos or comment on them in some way. What is it that appeals to you about this? Now, if you hang around me long, you'll, as Debbie will tell you, you'll find that I'm very, very much attuned to how language affects what people, how people hear us. And so right there, I, I gave you one little gem of how to draw out a client, to never ask them, why don't you like this? Never ask a why question. Always ask a what about question. What about this don't you like? What about this affects you so positively? What about this isn't working for you? You will find this opens the door to you understanding them in deeper ways and as I'm going to point out in a moment, understanding another person's what matters to them is the key to becoming a very effective kitchen designer and watching your sales increase. So I'm going to show you here a fractalized traditional kitchen. You're going to see where I've got the arrows. I changed the door opening to the dining room to an arch. I added a little arch in the glass door that's centered there on that little bar area as you uh, kind of almost like a little butler's area right there as you go into the dining room. We chose the chairs to have a bit of an arch to the end of it. You'll see a, a arch done in sections, number four right there at the end of the peninsula. And you'll see again that that affected the choice of the faucet. I'm using scaling, I'm using resemblances to tie this room together. Now, if any of you were to guess how old this kitchen is, 
it still looks pretty darn current, and certainly in some markets it would be very current. You'll also see at the point of tr transition along the ceiling, I broke from matching the cabinets to using wood. I emphasized that tr transition up into the ceiling. But on the other hand, down on the toe kick, I diminished that transition. I could have made that a wood one. I, the transition's tied into the painted cabinetry. It was a conversation we had. You'll also though notice on the island, it's a different material. And the, there, the toe kick does match the cabinet. And that, of course, makes visual sense. This kitchen is actually 16 years old. I want you to think about that. This kitchen would sell this home today. There's also fractal, fractalized symmetry in this. Notice the open shelves right there to the end. Why, why, you know, what about that? <laughs> See, I almost did the very thing I told you not to do. What about that works so much better? It softens the symmetry. Still feels symmetri symmetrical because of the plate racks flanking the hood, yet it also opens up the view path out to the window. If I had done a door, like on the left side of the hood, when you're standing there at the cooktop and, and, and wanting to look out to see what's happening in your yard, that sharp corner of that wall cabinet would have cut off the view. So it opened up those sight lines and it transitioned the cabinet solidity to the window's openness and it's a UFO at the same time. Unexpected, fun occurrence, why? Because it gives you decorative things you can do there. Richard, Richard yeah. uh, um, there's someone that would like you to explain uh, resemblance a little bit further. It's, they sh it's a little confusing to them. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Well, you can kind of you can go back up here. You can see that number four is in sections of an arc. So there's a shape, but that sh forms an arc. It's just done in sections. And if you look at number one and number two and number three, you'll see actual arcs that we would or, you know, say, well, that's an arc. At the same time, the end of the peninsula does trace an arc. If you're walking around it, your path is an arc. So there's a resemblance between also the fact that the back of the chair is not a cabinet. And that over there, number two, it, it, there's the arch on the cabinet. And number th one is a trim casing. None of those are the same type of thing or the type of element, and yet they all resemble each other. So resemblance is about things that are different in type, and yet we can make a connection to them. The chair is not the same as the cabinet. The cabinet's not the same as the door opening. And it's certainly not the same as the end of that counter in granite. So we have four different materials, four different types, and yet we as humans can make a connection between those elements. The arc of the faucet being the, you know, the fifth one there. And <clears throat> this is something we do so naturally that we don't even realize that we're doing it. And yet when you're working with your clients, if they're hesitant about choosing something, these are the useful ways of, of getting them to a place where they're comfortable. Because as designers, we're always fighting this, I, the fact that the clients we're working with have become accustomed to, they've adapted to, and they've adjusted to spaces, feeling, and looking a certain way for so long, they think it's normal. They think, as Sarah Williams Goldhagen said, it's indisputable, it's objectively good. So I hope that helps. If it doesn't, uh, we'll find another way to approach it. So here I'm actually scaling negative space. The ends of the cabinets are three different ways of approaching negative space. Negative space is where you could have them filled in, and yet it's not. At the end of an island, I love doing this kind of thing because it improves flow around the room and around the end of an island. I basically use two uh, corner inside corner fillers for the cabinets and have the shop finish uh, all sides of the filler and then I get an angled filler uh, four and a quarter inches as I recall back uh, back cut by the shop and we just field assemble them if we need to 
like that. It makes a nice way to hang that dreaded towel that is too often hanging on the refrigerator or on the oven handle. Uh, I have this certain kind of obsession about not having the hand towel hanging in places that uh, become a feature of the kitchen. So you have the negative space at the end of the wall cabinet, you have the negative space at the end of the island, you have the negative space at the end of the peninsula. We make a connection between these things, whether we realize it or not. There's more negative space in here uh, with the open plate racks. You know, I could just keep going on. Negative space above the cabinets, uh, flanking the hood that match the, uh, you know, the balance each other as well. There's the, the, the uh, duopoly of, if you please, of, of twos. Notice the two. Uh, plate rack holes, uh, spaces. Notice the two glass doors above the ovens. There's twos going on in this space as well. You know, so I'm fractalizing shapes. I'm fractalizing textures. I'm fra fractalizing patterns. I'm fractalizing color. Uh, there's just so many ways of creating a space that's very rich and yet feels you know, coherent. Uh, this is in music. This would be more like you've moved, and we have moved in our profession into the Romantic era, if, as opposed to back in the era of Bach and and uh, people uh, that came before Chopin started to break the mold. And by the time Mussorgsky came in, we were hearing music with with ninths and elevenths and thirteenths and altered rhythms and things like that. It's for those of you who remember uh, and were fond of Led Zeppelin, it's part of what made them an astonishing group because they would overlap time signatures in very unusual ways. Uh, basically fractalizing music and it's what made their music so enduring. Little side note for those of you who grew up uh, about the same time that many of us did. So what it, now I'm gonna break away to that fourth objective, which is sharing some things that will, I hope, enable you to get your clients more comfortable to move in directions that initially they will react to in a negative way. And I can hear some of you saying, you yeah, know, my clients are going to be afraid to do this, uh, especially if they talk to the realtor or other people. Oh, you're going to kill your, your, your resale value. Keep in mind that realtors in particular are selling things that are already out of date by the time they sell them if they're out of existing housing stock. Uh, so they're not really in touch with where things are going and are. So showing our clients unfamiliar concepts and proposing unexpected solutions are, is going to trigger resistance. So what does that mean? I always start every meeting, every meeting with my clients with these two assurances. Look, every idea we're talking about is it, just a placeholder until you figure out what most matters. Now, I am going to present ideas to you and oftentimes press you in ways that you, you're going to react. And you, you might even say, stop pushing it. We don't want that. What I'm looking for is a reaction, not to force you, push you to do something you don't want. I'm, I am asking you, what about this don't you like? What about this is causing you to react? Because your reaction is information about something that matters to you. So then I also add to these two advisories, the, what, what I call the three uns. Unfamiliar concepts or unexpected solutions will cause uncertainty. I know that. So I advise you just stay in the process until you figure out what most matters. Or as I just said, Keep your plans to yourself until you do figure out what ma most matters. I have literally had to have clients repeat, this is our kitchen, because they're showing it to their friends, or in one case, the, the, my client was showing it to her sister and her mother. What do you think? What do you think? And I had to have her literally look me in the eye, take my hands, repeat after me, this is my kitchen. And you know what? She couldn't say it. She said, I know. And I said, no, say that. This is my kitchen. Well, I know it's my kitchen. I said, no, say, this is my kitchen. And she finally said it. And she looked at me and she says, I get it. Quit talking to my mother, my sister. 
I said, yes, they don't understand how you got to this mixed material, how you got to this nine foot long walnut island in the shape of a five foot diameter end that looks like a giant keyhole how that connects to your husband's childhood growing up in New England and keyholes underneath doorways and how un disconnected he was from the design process until he saw that keyhole. And, and I'm using, therefore, resemblance connection when I because he was watching the design process with his arms folded. And when I drew that island in the shape of a keyhole, he uncrossed his arms and leaned forward. And I knew, I deliberately drew the island in that shape because I knew where he'd grown up and I knew that he would respond to that keyhole shape. And he did, and he got engaged and he got excited and he, and he, and he wanted the island now to be all walnut whereas the wife wanted the kitchen to be painted and we ended up with a mixed material island and that was 20 years ago that i did that kitchen and it still looks great why do we need this three uns because friends and family will attempt to protect your client from the crazy designer so we really do need to work with them to be able to assert themselves that this is their home. It needs to inspire them. It needs to be transformed visually. It needs to be uh, satisfy them functionally. It needs to inspire them emotionally. That's a whole other seminar I do, uh, which some of you may have taken. Transform, satisfy, inspire. So you heard me mention earlier, what causes clients to trust us? They trust someone who understands what matters to them. How they get to that point is we have to be able to reveal the things that matter to them and listen to them. And when we do that, they, they really come to believe we understand them and, believe, and we do. And they become more open to seeing some of these fractalized things that we're going to be looking at again in a moment. It's not about the wish list then. It's not about the wish list. If your primary objective is to make sales, yep, focus on the wish list because that's the fastest way to make a sale. Satisfy the wish list, bam, you got a sale. Yet it's also the way to keep your profits down to not achieve the highest possible margins because people shop you around when they have a wish list. They shop you around. Move from wish list design to most matters design because when you reveal and understand what is driving the client's wish list, that's what most matters. They came up with this wish list as their best way to resolve their problem. And when you go in and reveal what actually drove them to make the wish list and propose different ways of resolving it, they become inspired. They become so inspired that it's not unusual for a client who tells me this is our budget, we don't want to spend a penny more, to willingly go over what they told you their budget was. That client I mentioned earlier about the keyhole-shaped island when his arms became uncrossed, went on to spend three times what he told his wife he was willing to spend on that kitchen because suddenly he connected to the kitchen in ways it was much more than just a functional space. It became an emotional space. And when clients connect to a space emotionally, it's amazing how much more they were, will become inspired and justify spending on their project and become open to new ideas because you become more than a designer in that moment. And this is so powerful. You become an advocate. You become an advocate for their best interest. You are relating to them in ways that no other firm, no other designer, salesperson is relating to them. You're, you're understanding them. You've surfaced what matters to them. You're showing them new ways of addressing it. You're supporting their efforts to stay within budget, and yet they start saying things like, you know, if it costs a little bit more, that's okay. That's okay. I hear this all the time from people because at the end of the day, in life, there are oftentimes only a few really, really inspirational, emotional moments, benchmarks. One of them, like, is birth. 
of a child. Another is weddings. And I remember when my daughter got married, she justified spending five times what I thought she should have to spend on that wedding. She came up with the money. And uh, that's what I told her. I said, here's daddy share. Why? Because she could justify it. So when you become, I was still her advocate for getting married. I understood the power of inspiration because that's my world, inspire my clients to make changes to their home. And yet in that moment, if we really work to surface that emotional core of things, people become inspired. So I'm going to pause and see if any questions have been triggered by that. Well, I think you are inspiring some folks out there because they want the recording. They want to take detailed (laughs) notes. There was was a question that came up earlier on when you mentioned um, you were talking about that specific kitchen. You said you mentioned wood where you sit. Do you mean the cabinets below or countertop or what? I mean was it countertops, there? yeah. Countertops, you'll see all of in many, many, many places in my work, you know, counters that, where people sit, if they're stone or any of those materials, they're cold, they're, they're noisy, they're not warm to the touch, you know, they're, uh, and they're oftentimes cause glare because they're, if they're glossy, uh, especially with LED lighting, it's a very sharp, oftentimes light. Uh, I remember uh, one of our local distributors of, the, of, of surfaces had to remodel his kitchen because he would come in and his, when his father would visit, he'd find newspaper all over the counter. And he goes, Dad, what are you doing? He says, oh, man, the glare off these lights, it just kills me when he's sitting down at the counter. So, you know, wood isn't going to cause uh, reflective uh, glare. It's warm to the touch and it's not noisy. And people therefore like sitting at it. That's why most of the time dining room tables are wood because it's it's much more comfortable to us. And Richard, one more, please. Um, okay. So what was the second idea that you suggested um, after you said ideas are just placeholders? Reactions are information. Ideas are placeholders until you figure out, it's always about figuring out what most matters. And this is very calming for clients. I have had clients actually say to me, quit proposing that, Richard. I told you I don't like it. And I I finally said, would you be willing to go to a home and see where I've done this? Yeah, if it gets you off my back, I'll do that. Okay, fine. I set it up. They go. I don't go with them. So they get pure, unfiltered feedback from the client. And so they, I remember one lady, I had proposed something and she just was adamant she would not like it. She said, quit doing this, et cetera, et cetera. I'm now my, incidentally, my fourth project with this client. Uh, so this has long legs and long implications when you begin to work this way with people. She went to visit this client and on the way back, she called me from the car and, she's, and she said, Richard, I went and saw Glynis. I went and saw this this idea that you were proposing. and and this is to quote her, damn you, Richard, you're right. I love it. I just didn't understand it. Bingo. That's the thing we're up against. People have no history of living in spaces that have the kind of things that you might be proposing to them. This is where 3D imagery now is really helping me. So unexpected solutions kick in fear. My placeholder idea here was that when I walked into this kitchen, I walked the home. If you do not walk around the entire main floor, at least of the house, and see where groceries come in from the garage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where the bathroom is, et cetera, I've had remodels kicked off and major changes happen because I noticed the way the bathroom door opened up right into the kitchen. And I said, doesn't this make you uncomfortable? And they said, yeah, it's going to cost a lot of money to change that. Well, you're going to waste a lot of money if you don't change it. And let's so let's just remember my rules. Ideas are placeholders. If we can resolve this and have a killer kitchen when you're done, are you willing to at least entertain the idea? And they go, well, okay, fine. Because people don't like the idea of wasting their money. So off to the side here, and I really wish I had a photo of it, there was an eating nook. And so I proposed that we would remove all of these you know, cabinets at the end of the room and put windows there to look out at the pastures, this beautiful pastoral setting, and you couldn't even enjoy it from the kitchen. 
And so, of course, the reaction came, oh, no, I need all my wall cabinets. I won't have enough storage. This is the most common reaction I get. As I'm eliminating, typically I, I specialize in kitchens with few or no wall cabinets, especially now in the living room area of kitchens. So I came up with this solution and the ideas intrigued them. And they said, okay, you told us hey, in the process, we will, but boy, you're really going to have to prove to me. I was working with a lady who taught science in the school. So very left brain, very uh, linear in her thinking, um, like my mom. The plan developed into this layout and eventually emerged into this kitchen. Where you just looked at the end there was all wall cabinets. Now look at it. It's all, what a, um, and what a beautiful room. You're surrounded by light. Now in cognitive psychology, you would learn that the three glands in the midst of your brain, the amygdala uh, is right there, is the hypothalamus, pituitary, and pineal glands, Yes, I'm getting very sciencey on you. Yet it's important to realize that light from two different directions like this, two different sky colors, stimulates those glands so physiologically you feel better. And this is why the corner office is, is where the CEO or the executive or those who are higher up sit. But this is also why bedrooms, who have, which have only one window, predispose those who are in those rooms to not feeling as good. Literally predispose them to being more depressed. So I work on ways to get light into bedrooms from different directions. Sometimes I replace the doors to the bedrooms with glass panel doors with skylights in the hall out above so light can come into the room from two different sky colors. Lots of strategies. That's a whole other seminar. So there you are. Uh, look at the fractalization of the of the edge. Remember transition. The counter edge is a point of transition. Notice the chiseled edge. Notice the patterns, how the, well they work with that chiseled edge. Notice the negative space above the ovens, how that negative space uh, reflects what's going on over there in the window that's behind the cooktop. Yes, you can do windows behind cooktops as long as, as it's a fixed window. It can't be opening. And that's also an unexpected fun occurrence, to have a window behind the cooktop and then to have that transition energy of the chiseled edge. And guess what everyone does who comes and sits there? They run their fingers over the edge uh, of that. Um, I think normally you would see this, and in fact, I know normally you would see this, she lays placemats out. Because even though she loves that stone and that island, she just couldn't get her head around having wood or even a boundary of wood around the island. So what does she do? She puts down placemats so that you counter the noise, you counter the coldness, and you counter the glare. <laughs> so we compensate. So where did all the storage go? How did I reassure her? Well, computer-aided design and manufacturing are moving us to a new normal. I'm seeing this particularly at the high end, and it's going to keep coming down because people are embracing it more and more. They're finding out about this more and more. They're finding shops that are very willing to do this at very low cost to them. Uh, you can see in this photo, my drawers are actually six inches longer than the normal 21-inch drawer that you get with an undermount guide. And when you add that extra six inches, you get twice as much in the drawer. In this photo, you're also seeing specialized drawer right there to the left of the cooktop, right below it in the picture. You'll see how I combine two uh, drawer faces onto one drawer, and I call that a chef's drawer. So counters are getting deeper. High-end European companies are offering kitchens with 27-inch counters and 15-inch uppers. In my kitchens, I start with 30 inches deep. And I also change the uh, top drawer face to seven or seven and a half inches high. That could, people will say, boy, this is gonna cost more. Well, not really. One shop only charges me more to add for the extra cost of the drawer guides and another shop charges me 25% more. And believe me, clients can justify it because fewer wall cabinets also amount to a lot of savings. And I've had kitchens where it costs, I have one 25 box kitchen I could do with nine boxes that cost probably about one and a half times as much, but it was actually cost less than the original design of the kitchen. And that allows us, allowed us to have art on the walls and kitchen windows. 
So anxiety is going to kick in when you propose the unexpected. And I'm just going to you know, rip through this. You can use images. You can show it in your showroom. It's extremely profitable because it sets you apart from your competitors. Uh, and it gives you add-on features like you can do. You, you have to prove it oftentimes. I've had literally some clients calculate the square inches of what they currently have and compare it to what I'm proposing. I have to prove it with my 100 items storage analysis that I have with my clients. The items in red are the key ones everyone seems to have in their kitchens. And I make sure those are accommodated. You'll see the wet dish towels there on my list. I don't want to overlook it. But you do have to prove it. And 3D imagery is very helpful. This kitchen floor plan, if I had shown this to the kitchen right out of the box after we did our initial uh, conversation, I went away, came up with this idea. If I had showed them this, I know they would have rejected it out of hand. It looks weird on paper. And so I actually paid out of pocket for my, uh, I, found, I have found a modeler. I don't have the time or energy to really master the kind of modeling I'd like to use. And I find that the design programs that are out there that are tied in with cabinetry typically are too limiting. And so I've developed relationships uh, using Upwork and other sites uh, that uh, I've located um, people who can do this work for me at a very nominal cost. Uh, and believe me, they're out there that you do have to go through a process to identify them. So when I went to the meeting to present the idea to the client, I showed them this and they go like, oh my gosh, that are you sure? This looks really weird. And then I whipped out this and they literally gasped. They said, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I mean, I, what? <laughs> and I will point out some fractals in this. Notice the big window behind the kitchen sink. That did not exist before. Notice the grid marks in it. Notice to the right, there's another one. That's the Papa Bear's the big one. There's Mama Bear above what is actually the ovens. I love to hide ovens. I make the cabinet deeper, 30 inches deep. I do pocketing doors on either side. Suddenly your ovens go away. They completely disappear. There's actually four ovens, well, four elements, an oven, a steam oven, a warming drawer, and a coffee maker behind those doors over there to the right. And then under the island, you'll notice again a uh, Again, a window, basically, I've a window under the island, which is an unexpected fun occurrence. And then I walked them through all the different elements that I was doing in this, including a TV that would rise up from below. Uh, and there's actually back-to-back -back TVs. So in the living area, they, you, they can watch it, and they can also watch the same thing uh, in the kitchen area. Now, obviously, this is not a starter kitchen. Um, you know, I. I had a client who said, we want something that's artistic. And I also can model up in the soffit light. We are in a new world of lighting. This is uh, just to let you know, lightheaded design out of Vancouver, BC. Uh, five one inch lights that you can pair up in one, two, one, three, five, ten, and 15 inches. Puts out amazing, really interesting light. You can get different reflectors. And you can hide it in little as two and a half inches of space. So question, pause. Anything out of that section? I've been ripping through this pretty quick. <laughs> yes, there's a couple of things here. So first of all, um, the stone uh, where yes. you were describing, where you had the, uh, the, the window over the range. What was yes. that stone? Uh, that's rainforest uh, green, I believe. Rainforest green or green forest? Rainforest. That kitchen is like 10 years old. So I've is it soapstone, it. Richard? No, it's not. It's a metamorphic stone. For those of you who aren't familiar with that term, marble we know, granite we know. Metamorphic stones are in the middle between granite and marble. They, I'm fond of them because they typically have the most dynamic patterns to them. Okay, and then uh, you were talking about in that same kitchen, the base cabinet being 30 inches deep. Someone has okay. a question about why 30 inches deep. Well, actually the counters are 30 inches deep. I do 28 and three quarters on the base cabinet because that accommodates a 27 inch drawer guide from uh, whoever you're using, Salici Balloon. They all have them. Well, not all of them actually do, but I, at least I know one of the more common ones, Bloom has them. Um, and I believe you'd find them in other lines. Bloom is the one I'm most familiar with. And okay. it takes uh, literally 27 and three quarters inside the cabinet for that guide to fit. Now, 
pullouts, you have to actually do a nail on or rabbit on back because you've moved the the pullout back inside the cabinet. Just remember that if you specify a pullout inside of a cabinet like that. And be careful if you go to the deeper cabinet, 20 and three quarters does not fit through a two foot six door opening. But if you nail on the back of the cabinet, it's 28 inches and that will. So I'm giving you some caveats if you're gonna to go to the deeper counter. This is why the European manufacturers, I believe have standardized on a 25 and three quarters deep with a 27 inch counter because that fits through all the doorways. Okay, and then um, once again, the lighting in that 3D image that you mm -hmm. showed there, what was the, the lighting company? Light-headed. Yes, Divine. and that was in Vancouver? Yeah, you, yeah, Vancouver. If you look it up, it'll pop up. Okay, it's, and then, it's, their, it's their minimalist. If you did lightheaded and minimalist, you'll find it. Okay, uh, and then the CAD program for the 3D. Any um, any idea what that is? Yeah, yeah. Um, the modeler I work with uses uh, Chief Architect, Chief. and uh, he's a beta tester, so he's he actually goes beyond what Chief Architect can tell you you can do. Uh, just if you're using that, one way to do curves, if they're not accommodating it, is you build a shape and then you take uh, the front of the cabinet you want to use and you make it one eighth of an inch deep and you skin it, you skin the curve with it. It's a little trick to get around the limitations of the software. Okay, and then the final question here, any additional ventilation that's needed for building in the ovens? Um, is self-cleaning a concern? Uh, it is, and you should do some sort of protective surface above the oven because they're recessed in. Uh, typically, I'll do a stainless steel. I've even used a cookie sheet in one case, uh, pinned to the top of the cabinet. So yeah, very, very good question. And I, a lot of times I will also put uh, an additional ventilation in the ceiling right directly above to keep the odors from migrating throughout the house. We, you know, people overlook that. Uh, and it's very important to, I think, add two ways of ventilating, especially in these open kitchens, you know, to be able to pull out air uh, right above that area. And then we were talking about the countertops and the coldness of some of the stone versus wood. Yeah. Um, do you do you have any further thoughts on that? Well, sometimes my clients have me put warming mats under their counters. Okay, but I mean, like, I you know, that look and feel of coldness that stone exudes. Right. So I heard you, I heard you, yeah, well, I think they're just wondering, like, you know, is, do you prefer that the stone versus the wood or is there, I guess it depends on the client. No, it really does depend on the client. I definitely prefer textured materials, the mats, the hones, et cetera, because at least you've countered glare uh, by doing that. And, you know, so um, we need to move on because we're going to run out of time, Deb. So thank you. thank you. Fractals in simple terms to go back and review. These are the four things. And I'm very glad you're recording this uh, so people can go back. Here's a fractalized tutor that I did literally 24 years ago. Uh, you can see lots of curves. I've pointed them all out. Look at all the arrows. The long arch, the arch above that, the arch of the doorway, the arch underneath the cabinet, the arch in another cabinet, the uh, on the left hand, the curve of the hood is actually turning the arch horizontally. There's a fractured arch, arch in that cabinet I had made. There's even curves in the microwave. And there's a UFO. We cut the corners out of some tiles because she found these little butterfly one inch tiles she loved. And she, she likes to have people come and count and find the seven butterfly tiles that she has in her kitchen. Fun little activity. Here's UFO. For, there's a refrigerator off there to the left. It's not an armoire. If you raise the refrigerator up a bit, and I'm gonna show you a little trick for making hiding it even more. Here's again a high uh, refrigerator that's hiding, a little bit of UFO with the giant knobs on the face of the refrigerator and the colored lights. But here's how you hide a refrigerator. I love doing this. Put a drawer front on the bottom, make the doors up above fake. They can open the drawer door. Um, I do this all the time. It's so obvious otherwise that you've built in the refrigerator. Uh, you know, it's just very, very plain. And this is a nice way to hide it. 
Here's some counter transitions where you can add and elevate this. This is very useful with 3CM material because it gives the installers a place to, to uh, anchor the dishwasher. It's really hard otherwise because a lot of them are still anchored at the top. And so they have to drill holes in stone and do other things. But if you put a, a layer underneath the stone, you have the opportunity to decorate it. You'll also see here transitions at the corners. You notice the one's a little three-step corner with a round a corner round underneath it. You off to the other one, I used a little dishwasher end panel and an angled filler in that recess to create that. Again, all these have deeper counters. Negative space above the oven, bringing in a little bit of art, art into the space. Uh, tie in a, a structural element here, the unexpected fun occurrence of a J-shaped eating bar, again in walnut. The unexpected fun occurrence of the refrigerator handles uh, being done. And uh, I, I found out later that we had to actually pin these in place because the brass inserts pulled loose from the uh, post of the handle because the handle itself was pewter, as I recall. Again, you see that stone that I showed you earlier. So you can fractalize counter transitions. You, you're seeing more and more of these elevated type of ones. This is a kitchen I, I spotted uh, out of the uh, Trends International Design Awards out of Australia. One of my own kitchens where I bulked up the ki kitchen uh, edge to four inches thick. <clears throat> but I'm also, this is one of my favorite things to do now with clients. It helps reduce the cost of your centerized stone. In this case, it's decked in trillion. Trillium. I actually have the shop make the top drawers two millimeters, one eighth of an inch shy, uh, higher than the box to cover the transition. And I put a contrasting element underneath that to elevate the counter edge. And I also, in this kitchen, joined the an unexpected fun occurrence here to cutting boards to pull out and make this into a 20 foot long island when they're entertaining. When they want to, they can have more counter space if they'd like. But you're also seeing here a little bit of a clip on the corner to reconcile the little notch there at the end. Because this is, again, we've become so familiar with these sharp, sharp corners, but they trigger the fight or flight reflex in our amygdala. That's a physiological fact. It's one of the eight things hardwired into your brain. So yet we're, we've become so accustomed and adapted and so visually oriented towards these really sharp corner type of things, uh, spaces and kitchen designs, we think it's normal and good. And yet it is in some way to harming you even though you don't realize that it is. And, and that is just the way it is. So summarizing, nature loves dynamic design. Kitchens now are multifaceted, complex, Things are functionally positioned, open, temporally attuned. And I'm going to, you know, here my client found this piece of wood. Uh, they loved it, and we integrated it into what is otherwise a very modern space, but it's in a very, very wooded setting. So it was a perfect way, using the resemblance connection, to make the kitchen feel connected to what was going on outside and to the water in the stream. Look at the tile that evokes the texture of the water rippling down the stream. There's so many ways that this connects to, and then that little window off to the right of the refrigerator, bringing in light from the west when the sun is setting opening it up to, there's various sheens, there's the high gloss on the counter, the texture, uh, the swirly on the stainless, the matte on the, on the uh, counter there. The obvious UFO in this kitchen, which is 14 years old, is the uh, spike legs on, these, uh, on the kitchen island. But you're also seeing resemblance connection. Look at the rectangular shape, and then it's evoked in the doors. It's evoked in that open passage above the uh, ca cabinets between the kitchen and the dining room. And then the glass doors, we turn that shape vertically. Uh, I could just keep going on and on. The, notice the fact that the middle drawer in this kitchen is deeper than the bottom drawer. Why put your heaviest things on the bottom? Uh, drawer and there's facets on the edges of these painted ones that match to the basic the faceting that's going on elsewhere in this kitchen. It's just on and on. Should sinks be centered on windows? You probably didn't even notice that it wasn't. It's not in this kitchen. Not in this kitchen. Notice I reconciled on the kitchen on the left. I put an arch on there. This kitchen was done in 2004, and there's the bay window 
that evokes that same arch. I broke the arch on either side of the range into a half arch, and I did the island. The end of the counter is a soft, softened form of a segmented arch. All of these are papa bear, mama bear, baby bear, baby bear, baby bear, cousin bear. All of these are connecting through resemblance connections in very sophisticated ways. Here's again a kitchen where it's not. So if you are gonna center a kitchen sink on a window, please get rid of that bar, that post between the windows. As you see here in the lower picture, this is my favorite way to do it. I'll do two awning windows or two slider windows at the bottom of the window. And look at what that does, how it beautifully frames that gorgeous backyard you see the arch above the window. You see the arch at the end of the island. You see it in the shelves. You see the arch in that Fu Tung Chen uh, hood. You see the arch and these chair backs. You, uh, you see how I've used that resemblance connection in multiple ways, even in the lighting, using that monorail up in the ceiling. If you were to look at the dispendants, you'll see that the those circular shapes are actually arched as well. You see it in the faucet, you see it in the handles, you see it in the handles on the oven. I mean, it just keeps going on. And this kitchen was so fun to do. I did a 32 foot long library ladder uh, that rolled on rails all the way around it. Now there's where you need CAD CAM because I had to make that accurate, the soften on which the, uh, the shop had to make it within two millimeters tolerance. Uh, to get the ladder, which came out of Germany, to work. And also in this kitchen, unexpected fun occurrence, cook from both sides. You can cook from both sides. Another one is that seven inch high Jatoba block on the island. Why? Because the husband was six foot seven. That's where he works. And the wife was five foot five. So you have to reconcile that. So you see different heights throughout this whole kitchen, working it together, very dynamic. So one last question, pause. Anything come up? Hello? Hi, Richard. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, a couple of things, actually. So um, getting back to those ovens inside the cabinetry, how do you get those to pass electrical code? How do you get around that? I'm not sure what about electrical code wouldn't pass. It's all wired in correctly. It is wired in correctly at the back. And uh, you know, you're you're not, you know, I don't know. I've never had it come up with an inspector. Maybe, maybe I will. But if it, it did come up, I guess I would. If he had an issue with heat getting trapped, uh, we can vacate that heat in multiple ways. And actually, come to think of it, I just did this in a project where we found excess heat was building up inside the cabinet, and so I put in some fans for audiovisual exhausting heat out of uh, closed environments, and we exhausted fan through the counter up above. We cut a hole in the counter up above, and uh, the fans that audiovisual people use are very small and they take out like, I don't know, a huge amount of air, 30, 40 cubic feet per minute uh, when they're set up that way. I, another strategy would be to use grills on those doors uh, as part of your overall look and feel of the kitchen. There's and, multiple ways it could be done. And speaking of the doors, people are wondering how do you retract those doors, um, you know? Well, they, you use your standard flipper door hardware. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, and, then, and because the cabinet is so deep, you can actually get the flipper doors to go all the way back. If you, if we all know what happens if you have an 18 inch high flipper door in a 12 inch deep cabinet, it sticks all the way out over the counter. So um, yeah, having a nice deep cabinet, you, you can get the flipper door to go all the way back to where the handles actually hit the, the face of the cabinet on either side. Okay, great. And there was a question about the, the list that you showed earlier on where you had some you know, g general things that were on your list that you ask people, your clients. So that's that 100, the recording. Well, yeah, that'll be in the recording. Uh, 100 right. items in seven categories that you find in a typical kitchen. It just gets people talking. It, one of the things I say to my clients is, look, at the high level, we start, I call it a five-step process, aiming, zoning, composing, detailing, assigning. First, when we're early meeting, we're getting this aimed. And we'll be doing a seminar or webinar on that in December called the Six Pathways to, I think we titled it Six Pathways to Aim Your Design. 
uh, where I'll be explaining how you can aim and design in ways that people don't expect using the six pathways every home has. And, uh, you know, view light, people, sound, smell, and touch. And uh, uh, coming up actually in July, we're doing another seminar on small spaces living large, just to put a plug in. And we're going to get into a lot of the things in more detail that we've been just skipping over today. Uh, but again, it's about assuring the client that, that early stages, we're just focusing on the how you use the kitchen, where you are, macro level, that's the zoning. Where do you want these usage you know, patterns to happen? Where you're distributing or you're collecting things like a baking center or a coffee center or a wine center or homework center, whatever it happens to be in our area, recycling center, et cetera. You know, we have to zone our space around usage to start. And yet at the same time, we have to then counter the fear that something's been overlooked. And the best way to do that is to look at items because every item has a use attached. So when I go through that item list, I often will surface a usage uh, pattern in the kitchen that has not been discussed. And this is how I give my clients the assurance that they're going to have few or no regrets. And it's also why I just recently got a call from a client whose home I did literally um, so long ago, I don't want to admit, but it's also the fourth project that we're going to be doing together. So these things make such a strong impression. She says, I still have the card you gave us. And I'll just tell you over 20 years ago, uh, she hung onto my card. It made that much of an impression. And now, you know, she's moved and we're a different home, and et cetera, et cetera. But people will stay so loyal to you because you did that for them. You gave them a space that wasn't just transformed visually. It, it wasn't just satisfying functionally. It connected to them emotionally. It inspired, you know. And actually, that is the whole book called Emotional Design that uh, <clears throat> traces this and how this is what Steve Jobs did to make Apple the company that it is. Uh, he, he had different terms for it, behavioral, reflective, and, and uh, um, I can't even remember. But anyway, <laughs> I transform, satisfy, inspire. Looks great, works well, feels right. <laughs> is, is this our final pause or will we have another this, pause? This is it. This is it. Okay. You know, right. After this, I'm going to tell you that beauty is the child of the coherent relationship between parts. You know, so this is why, this is a wonderful book, The Architecture of Happiness, you know, Fractalize Your Design. I want to thank Amarok for sponsoring our seminar. Peter, thank you. And uh, any other questions? I, if you want to hang on, I'm willing to stay as long yep, as people I, have questions. I, I, I do, sir. I do. So um, so this person we've been talking, you've been talking about shapes and mm -hmm. has um, clients who do not like round shapes. Since mm -hmm. everything looks rigid and stern, do you have any ideas how to convince clients to add a little softness with an introduction of round shapes or something like that? Yeah, I, I think one of the ways I showed you is to approach roundness as sections of an arc. It's, it's going to have the same effect on softening the end of it. Remember that really, really traditional kitchen that I showed you way up at the, at the beginning? And I'm going to just bail on this for a second and go back up to the very beginning where that kitchen was. And this, you know, there's softness in this shape. You know, you notice even on the table that they bought has angled clipped ends. That is familiar enough to people that it's a very good place to start. If you're not able to do an actual physical round, and I totally get that, this client, you know, wouldn't have, you notice really there's no real round shape to the island or the ends of counters, things like that. But that angle, that small clip, uh, makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, can you imagine if that was coming out of the eating nook, if that peninsula had ended with a blunt end? Now, there's also something going on. You've seen it quite a bit. I'm going to call attention. It shows in this kitchen here. It showed in that stiletto heels kitchen. I'm doing something that is anthropomorphic here. That shape is the shape of a hug. When I angle out a little bit at the end there, think about how your hand at the end of your arm, if you're going to hug someone, 
this is a hug type shape. It's using the resemblance connection. People make that connection, whether they realize it or not. It says to people, you know, come on in. You're welcome here. Come and hang out with us. And so you'll see this you know, fairly often in, in stuff. It's not something I just do to do. It's something that comes out of the pathways that we'll talk about in December, where you notice how people are moving through the space and you begin to shape the space around pathways, or you alter where a doorway is positioned to make the space flow better for people. A couple of ways I guess you could approach. I hope that helps. Okay. So there is another question here. We're, we're going to go back to the, the kitchen where you had the 30-inch drawers. Um, yeah. The question is, can you get the 27 and 3 quarters track in a heavy-duty capacity, let's say for 150 pounds or more? That's the only way you can buy them. Okay. Yeah, oh. that's the only way. And that's part of the reason why the hardware costs <clears throat> about three times as much. <clears throat> but you know, I itemize all that out for the clients so they understand it. Let's talk once more. I do have a question about that, what you call the chef's drawer in this particular picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there, there was some, you know, they were wondering about how that is done. Um, <clears throat> well, okay. The quickest way to probably answer that is to just bail on this all together and go to, do you have any other questions while I'm going here? Uh, let's see. Um, no, I think they were just asking if you've ever written a book <laughs> on, on the design process. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's kind of in the cards. How's that? <clears throat> so here's a, here's a chef's drawer that got used as a baking drawer instead. You see, I put two drawer fronts together. Now, in my world, uh, virtually every kitchen I do is going to be frameless, which enables, I've done it with framed cabinetry. You have to cut, have the shop cut the frame out and attach it and assemble this. And it's more complicated. They have to you know, basically fake the frame member because they have to recess it into the front of the drawer box itself, in like a quarter inch in. So it appears like a frame member between the drawer faces. It can be done. And again, it, it costs money. It might cost a couple hundred dollars. Again, the client justifies it because it makes everything they're using, you know, come up. Um, let me page through this a little. There's another chef's drawer. That one I just did with a single drawer front. I did a two drawer high. Um, you can, many manufacturers have a two drawer drawer base, so you can do it that way. Here's another one done. Um, I've got all these drawers, corners I do. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just taking you through. There's another one. <laughs> this is going to come up in our small spaces, living large. So if you come back in July, <laughs> I'm going to be able to show you a bunch more of these. How's that? That but this, sounds great. this is a classic chef's drawer. What you're seeing here is what I typically see. It's the most used stirring utensils, the you know, Pam and all the other type of things, the vinegars, the oils, the salt, the things that they use most common. I virtually, I can't even think of a kitchen that I've done uh, in, the, in the last, you know, ever since uh, this came into my, into my design vernacular. Uh, thanks to a client, this is how it all happens. They said, I don't want all that stuff up above. You know, it slipped at one time, slipped out of my hand, shattered on the counter. You know, can you put it down below? And I said, well, sure. And a lot of times I will do it here. And I've also done it as the second and third drawer because in our storage analysis, they need the top drawer for something else, like maybe uh, hot pads and other elements that uh, cutting knives, et cetera. Okay, Richard. Well, this has been great. I, I don't see any more questions at this time. I want to thank um, thank you so much, and thank Peter and Amarok. I know you're there, Peter. So thank you again for being with us today, and to to all of you in the audience. It's been great. You've gotten lots of wonderful accolades here in the chat box. So Richard, yeah. once again, you had to put up my last. Again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So much. You're quite welcome. It's been a, a, a real pleasure, and thank you to all my peers who've tuned in. Thank uh, you. I hope something that you've taken something out of this, uh, even if the reaction you have has been negative. That's information. Remember, reactions are information. Thanks again.